His face was a strong, a very strong aquiline with a high bridge of the thin nose and peculiarly arched nostrils with lofty domed forehead and hair growing scantily around the temples, but profusely elsewhere. His eyebrows were very massive, almost meeting over the nose and with bushy hair that seemed to curl in his own profusion. The mouth, so far as I could see it under the heavy mustache, was fixed and rather cruel looking with peculiarly sharp white teeth. These protruded over his lips. This is the No Fear Podcast. We know what scares you. I'm Matt. I'm Mel. And I'm Lisa. And this is the No Fear Cast, the podcast where we dissect horror and all the things that scare us. This is season two, episode 18. This is a first episode in a brand new series on vampires. The opening description is from Bram Stoker's 1897 novel, Dracula, which may be the definitive work when it comes to defining what a vampire is. We are lucky enough to be joined by Dacre Stoker, great-grand-nephew of Bram Stoker and author of several books continuing the Dracula mythos. All right, we are here with Dacre Stoker, the great-grand-nephew of Bram Stoker, and uh, thank you so much for being on our podcast, Dacre. Well, you're um, most welcome. Yeah, great to be here. <laughs> yeah, we're excited. Um, so I know you have written a lot of fiction and nonfiction about Bram Stoker and, of course, his most famous creation, Dracula. And uh, I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about how you got involved with that besides um, the family name and connection there um, and kind of what you've learned about him. Yeah, well, that's that's a great question because a lot of people come to me, you know, kind of wary, like, "Oh my God, did you grow up like the Adams family or the Munsters?" You know, because <laughs> because we're relatives of the famous brand, the Dracula creator. But you know, really, life was quite, you know, normal. I could say dull and boring in Montreal, Canada, growing up, except for around Halloween, when a lot of the friends would, you know, as a kid, would come to the door and go, "Oh, the Stokers, are you going to take my blood? Or are you going to give us candy?" And it got a little it got a little tiring after a while. But um, it was something that I guess by the age of 12, I asked my dad, you know, you know can, you, can you tell me a little bit about, you know, the family legacy? Obviously, there's something here. And never forget the day he sort of went out to the bookcase and reached up and there were some first editions of uh, books that Bram Stoker wrote, Dracula being one of them. Um, you, you, your listeners need to understand Bram Stoker is one of seven kids and his youngest brother was my great grandfather. So these books that we had in our possession had made their way, uh, obviously, to his youngest brother, then passed on to uh, his son, who ended up coming to Canada after World War I and marry a, a war bride. And, you know, there was three, three uh, sons um, out of that marriage, and one was my dad. And so we ended up with some of these cool books. And, you know, like Canadians who are, you know, close to British, they don't really pound on their chest and say, you know, come on, look at us. You know, we're, we're famous relatives of this guy that created Dracula. It's more sort of an understated thing. And, and also the other thing that has to be put in perspective is it really wasn't until about the, you know, the mid-70s that two Boston College professors, uh, McNally and Florescu, wrote a book called In Search of Dracula. And, and that book sort of opened the eyes of both popular culture and academia to Bram Stoker. It was, you know, they were trying to make this connection between who did Bram Stoker model his famous vampire after. And these guys found the notes uh, in the Rosenbach Museum. One was Romanian, and they had an idea that it was Vlad Dracula, and they sort of put this all together and said, this, you know, this is mu must have been what Irish writer Bram Stoker, uh, you know, was, was leaning towards. And, and they started finding different pieces of information in his notes that led him to Vlad Dracula. That's the first book I read um, was In Search of Dracula. I didn't read the actual novel Dracula until I was in college because I was like, really into sport. And, and, you know, sitting down reading a really slow gothic book was not my idea of a good time. But I eventually I did. And it sort of opened up my eyes to, man, this is this is really cool. But I really didn't quite get it until Ian Holt called me up and said, do you want to write a a sequel to Dracula with me. I said, well, I've never written you know, anything like this in my life. 
Uh, he said, well, we can get good editors. I've got some really cool ideas. But Lisa, that's when I started. This is sort of 2003, started digging into who Bram was. I, I went to the Rosenbach Museum and found the notes to Dracula, which have since been published by um, Robert A. T. Bissang and Elizabeth Miller. They're really cool source material for the writing of Dracula. Um, I actually found a journal of Bram's that was uh, in an attic in the Isle of Wight, um, owned by one of Bram's great-grandsons. So Bram did have a child, and that child had a daughter, and the daughter had some offspring. Of course, they're not named Stoker, but those great-grandsons are alive. Two of them are today, and they have some really cool stories and some really cool stuff. And I found that, um, that journal, and I went to Dr. Elizabeth Miller, who was a good friend, and she was one of the people that actually uh, deciphered Bram's notes to Dracula. I said, look, I need some help. I've got something cool. She said, you've got something very cool. I said, this is, <laughs> this is you know, kind of like, you know, for Dracula fans, after the notes to Dracula, this is like, you know, the Holy Grail. So it took us about a year to decipher the thing and figure out, you know, what was going on in Bram Stoker's mind while he was keeping this journal. And this was a journal he kept while he was still living in Dublin, a student working in Dublin Castle, but also during the most important transition in his life when he got the job working for Henry Irving in London. And so we get the sort of 11-year span of, of ideas for writing, observations, and it really helped me get inside this guy's head. Of course, you can read the biographies that other people have written about Bram. Sadly, he never wrote an autobiography. So this was the closest thing um, after reading these biographies and going to lectures that really helped me figure out this guy. So it helped in the writing process of the fictional book, Draco of the Undead. But once that was finished and promoted and it sold very well all around the world, bestseller in Spain and France and made the New York Times bestseller list. And that was, that was cool. It got me, you know, got me well known. But then I got into the, the nonfiction world of getting this thing published, which is, you know, much more stringent. And, you know, you've got to stand up to sort of academics and going off to academic conferences and sort of lecturing about this, this these really cool finds. So really in a period of, you know, from 2009 until 2012, when both a fiction book and a nonfiction were written, I sort of established myself as somebody that kind of straddles between the pop culture world and, and the academic world. And I, and I think that, you know, endears me a little bit to the fans because, you know, I, I get it. You know, some of the academic stuff is really over most people's head, but then some of the fanboy stuff is just, you know, really out there. I don't see every single Dracula movie ever made, every TV show, but I get a pretty good idea uh, of what's out there. And I enjoy really kind of straddling between both. But the, the important thing is that that's, that's put me out there. I do lectures. I get asked to be on uh, TV documentaries because I've, I've paid my dues and I've done a lot of the work. So all this information that you found, um, I just find this fascinating because I, I, I love the idea, and maybe this is the academic in me, <laughs> but I love the idea of um, uncovering this lost journal and uh and discovering these notes and, and kind of breaking open the mind of, of Bram Stoker um, through these writings that people had not seen in years and years and years. Um, but I, I know you go around, because you mentioned you go to, to some of these um, academic conferences and, of course, um, pop culture things. Uh, I saw you recently at uh, StokerCon in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, so you go around and present your... Uh, I think you're Stoker on Stoker. Um, yeah, it's, is, it, it's called Stoker on Stoker, the mysteries behind the writing of Dracula. And and, and that's, you know, it's, it's sort of a, a casual approach to the mind of Bram Stoker, what went on in his, in his childhood, that um, certain events in his life, like he was a sickly young child for seven years, stories his mother told him. These things, you know, in, in, in absence of an autobiography, we have to take a few leaps of faith and having been a school teacher and seeing, you know, coaching young children, teaching children in, in science and in physical education, I really got a sense that young Bram had a difficult childhood, obviously from being sick for the first seven years and have to be privately tutored. 
But I got also a sense of him sort of coming into his own physically as he got over this illness. And the illness has still never been diagnosed or at least put out there in public. I, I believe it was respiratory allergies because it was something that he grew out of and he became a champion athlete. Had it been something like scarlet fever, uh, rheumatic fever, some of these things that were common of the day, he would never, he would have had sort of a scarred cardiovascular system and never would have been a really good athlete. So it's something that you grow out of. And, and there's still in this day in the Stoker family, a lot of respiratory allergies and asthma. So I, I, I'm practically positive that's what it was, uh, but no definite proof, just sort of a good idea. But he did excel in things like rugby and rowing and race walking and gymnastics. And as that kind of came around uh, at the sequence of things, he also became very confident in the school in things like the Philosophical Society, the Historical Society, debating, acting, and that just sort of helped him blossom. Um, so I sort of cross-referenced the physical side of him, that social side, along with the things that he was writing. And you can kind of see a man emerging that was very aware of the world around him, but didn't have a great outlet. And the outlet that, that he was like striving for that need to be kind of kept private was writing and the sort of the fantasy world of the theater. He used to go to the theater with his dad. And uh, his father and him we used to critique. You know, there were he was a, a civil servant, and it was you know everything had to be kind of lined up just right. And they would critique the stage uh, decorations and the costumes and things. And uh, later in life, when Bram wanted to make a move himself towards putting on a play, uh, he had a bit of a crush on an American actress that he met in Paris, and his father just sort of stomped it out with this very strong letter saying, "The stage is no place for you." Stick with your job. This is where you need to be. And and the strange thing was, Bram, who was a middle child of seven, he was the only one earning an income um, while the father had just retired from Dublin Castle and three boys were going through medical school and the two sisters were being trained in the arts. And here's young Bram kind of bottled up in Dublin Castle as a clerk in Petty Sessions judicial system but trying to explore this creative side. And this is what this notebook did to him. He also snuck out and went to the theater uh, against his father's wishes and wrote theatrical reviews, but he had to do it anonymously so, and uh, he didn't get paid for it. So it was sort of the secret side of Bram that was sort of coming out. And uh, it, it, I mean, I look back at those years and it must have been very sad for the guy, but it wasn't until a meeting with Henry Irving, who was the most famous actor, Shakespearean actor of the time, who invited Bram to, to come to London and, and work with him. Because, you know, Bram was studying and he, and he was studying in mathematics and things that Henry Irving needed, sort of an accountant and a manager to keep things organized while Irving did all his acting. So this, this meeting of the two, the super creative and the bean counter, but Bram's creative side also was going to be satisfied and that's when, you know, everything sort of came together for the, the young man. He just sort of, you know, I didn't say threw caution to the wind, but got his confidence, moved to London. And the next 30 years, he's there and he's, you know, doing plays, but he's also starting his own writing. And this was just critical. He was in the right environment for it and no father there to sort of squash him down saying, and you must be the, the clerk of Petty Sessions. So... Oh, go ahead, Mel. Oh, I was just wanting to build on that. Do you see the theater and his interest in it as having a big influence on, in particular, Dracula? I, I do. I mean, no question, Mel. There was, um, I mean, the, one, one of the roles that Irving played very successfully during the time he was with Bram was Mephistopheles in Faust, which, of course, is, is the devil. And um, I, I believe that Bram had a plan to write the novel, Dracula, and then have the thing turned into a stage play where Henry Irving would have sort of ended his career. He was near the end of his acting career when, uh, when the novel was written, and, and he would have been an amazing Dracula. The strange thing is that Bram, just a couple of days before the novel was published, 
Bram, who knew the law very well, knew that to protect the stage rights of the, of the play, he needed to have a staged reading. And this, this thing went on at the Lyceum Theater. It only has to run one day by law. And he had people in the, uh, from the theater, uh, even set designers, reading parts. And Irving walked through and saw this and said, rubbish. And it must have been a down, you know, real downfall for Bram because it was, oh my God, the guy didn't even give it a chance. Many believe, who know more than I do about sort of the theater side of Bram, that there was some friction near the end of their uh, of their sort of life uh, when it came to making decisions on what plays were going to be done and not. And, and Irving sort of thought, well, you know, what does Stoker really know about this? Uh, these are my decisions. You know, Stoker is going to be in charge of the business side of things. And so it must have really hurt Bram that his idol, his boss, his good friend, the man who uh, could have been Dracula, uh, kind of said rubbish and dismissed the stage reading. So that's that's one piece, Mel. The, the other piece is that um, some of the things that Bram and Irving did together uh, through their 27 years together to elevate the role of the theater in society were very successful uh, to, to the point where, you know, theater used to be not much more than a carnival sideshow. But when, when Stoker and, and Irving were finished, you know, the, the, the creme de la creme would come, you know, all dressed up in, in formal dress. The costumes were much more accurate. The set designs were actually much more lavish, more expensive to put on. But one of the cool things that Bram did that, that sort of, you know, bled over to his books was he impressed upon you know, the way things were done, that people would use the proper dialects, that the uh, actors were just much more professional in their approach. Everything was done, you know, sort of properly, that if there wasn't just going to be a couple of bricks thrown up on a, on a painting on a, on a big set, it was going to be done the right way. So they used to go off to, to Central Europe and, and research what the castles would look like. And Bram made sure that he'd go to the right books to make sure that the actors were reciting their lines with the proper dialects. And the funny thing is, Bram did exactly the same thing in Dracula. And he had accurate places in his novel. He did a lot of research to make sure that the time was, was accurate to go from point A to B in a carriage or a train or a letter back and forth, that the castles that he used were described properly based on castles that he chose to model things after. And also that the dialect that he actually wrote when he was in Whitby um, or the way people spoke in Transylvania, he had it done accurately. So it's a great question. I think Bram's life in the theater had a major influence on his writing and not just Dracula, but, uh, but everything he wrote. So was a, a, a Dracula was produced... Um, as a play during Bram's lifestyle, uh, lifetime. No, it was after that. That's oh. that's the sad. That's how sad. You know, here's the theater guy that you know loved the theater, wrote reviews, all this stuff. But it wasn't until after he died, uh, it became a stage play. Um, he, he didn't get to see anything. I mean, Nosferatu, the the sort of the knockoff that his wife actually had to uh, use the British Writers Guild to fight against Prana Films. That was after Bram had died, and, and uh, his wife, um, Florence, actually uh, collaborated with um, uh, Dean and Balderston to actually make the proper stage play version of this. So, nope, he, he, all he knew about is that he, can, he wrote a book and um, you know, got pretty good reviews, but nothing really took off until after he was gone. So, you know, it is kind of bittersweet, and sometimes I think about I mean, in a kind of a corny way that, you know, I'm trying to, you know, heighten the awareness so more people get to know the relative that didn't get to know how successful of a genre he created. Well, yeah, because after Nosferatu, it, it kind of became a runaway train um, with different adaptations, um, movie adaptations and then TV and um, it, it's yeah, become that, ubiquitous. That, 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 you're right. You, you know, the Stoker, we kind of joke, we, we thank the Lugosi family because without Bella, both on stage and then on the big screen, 
um, that really sort of kickstarted everything. You know, he had this wonderful accent. One of the funny things about Bill Lugosi is that uh, he, he didn't he didn't speak English very well. So when he recited his lines in the 1931 uh, Todd Browning uh, film and also on stage, he was having to do it phonetically. And so that's why it, it sort of has become the the standard for a Dracula to sort of speak, you know, welcome, enter freely. You, know, it's, <laughs> you think if, if they had an actor that could speak, yeah, welcome, enter freely, it would have been a little easier. But nope, it's Lugosi's uh, language issues that sort of created the, the, the ringtone, let's just say. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that that's one of the things that we had talked about on a previous episode was actually that... Um, Lugosi was, I think, the second choice to play Dracula at that point. And um, the, it's, it's funny now looking back because he has become so iconic in that role and he set the tone for everything that has come since then. Um, I'm really interested in, in kind of the Stoker family's involvement because you mentioned that his wife had fought, or his widow, I guess, at that point, had fought... Um, the Nosferatu adaptation. Um, was it when you got involved with Ian Holt and kind of and Elizabeth Miller researching this that the Stoker family really got more involved in in this, or or has the Stoker family been um, behind the scenes with some of these Dracula adaptations? That that's a great question. Um, what I do know is Florence was involved, obviously, as, as you mentioned, uh, and I did earlier with the uh, you know, Fighting Prana film. She was involved with Dean and Balderston making, hel helping make um, the, the stage play adaptation, and which was then adapt adapted into, um, into movies. But at that stage, you know, it, it's sort of the family, you know, just kind of didn't, didn't pay attention. They, you know, they did get royalties um, from books, and they did get you know, royalties uh, or whatever the lump lump sum payment they they got from uh, Universal Films, so they did they did okay with it. A lot of people don't think they they did. As a matter of fact, cousins have a really cool story, in, in that monies that were were uh, gained from the from the movie um, and and the stage plays helped the family buy uh, uh, cottages on the Isle of Wight, so that. Uh, they could seek refuge during the bombing of World War II out of London. And so there's these little cottages they went to, obviously the Isle of Wight wasn't a big target like London was. The area in London that they lived was bombed quite heavily, um, but they were never affected on the Isle of Wight. So it's it's almost like, um, you know, the immortal Dracula saved the life of the Stoker, potentially saved the life of, of those Stoker descendants. Um, but it sort of ended there. Uh, the book went into public domain in 1962, and um, they really, you know, creatively, uh, the Stoker family didn't have too, too, too much, you know, connection. There was a relative whose last name is Farson, Daniel Farson, who one of Bram's brothers, Tom Stoker, had a daughter, and she married a Farson. So that guy did write a biography. Um, Daniel Farson did about Bram Stoker, but not n nothing more than that. Um, but they do have, as I said, some pretty cool artifacts. Uh, one of the cool things that I found um, not too long ago was a copy of Dracula, an early edition, that Bram used, and he marked the whole thing up um, to create the first abridged edition. So if you imagine, you know, there wasn't just computers in those days <laughs> that you just go all well, cut and paste this and take this out. You just, Bram actually took a, a, a a very valuable copy nowadays of Dracula and, and, and circle things and cross things out and made word counts and hand it back to his publisher and say, here, publish everything I didn't cut out. And that made the, the, the first abridge. And that's, that's pretty valuable. So they're very supportive. Uh, these great grandsons, um, my wife and I actually helped manage the Bram Stoker estate for them. And we tried to do some licensing deals with, um, with different people who want to, you know, make a pen or a, an, uh, an iPad uh, Stoker story or something like this, little figures, jewelry, um, but for Bram Stoker, not Dracula, because Dracula, as I said, is, is now public domain. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're supportive, um, but I'm kind of the, the bold one that decided it's time to do something about it.
You had mentioned earlier his research in the different places that he used in Dracula. Um, you have done some work on doing travel tours or guides, guided tours of places in Dracula. Am I right about that? Yeah. I mean, that's another one of these things. You know, I'm going to go where Bram Stoker never went. You know, he, <laughs> he in all this, he never went to Romania. I mean, as a matter of fact, you know, that part of the world was not very well known. I mean, in, in Bram's day, remember this is late 1800s, sort of the modern world ended at sort of Austria, Vienna, maybe into Budapest, Hungary, and, and that was it. Um, and so when Jonathan Harker went went off on the train to the land beyond the forest, it really was this mysterious area. And um, even though Bram traveled uh, up to Paris, we, we know he went as far as, as uh, Munich, he went to Italy. Uh, this is on Lyceum Theater trips when they were performing plays and doing research in plays. Um, but I know he never went to Transylvania. And so I thought, well, this is something I've got to do. I've, I've got to get over there and sort of look at the place. And a friend of mine, Hans de Roos, uh, who lives in Germany, was interested in sniffing around himself and doing some blogs and things about it. And uh, you know, it's really interesting because we're you're able to see in Bram's notes to Dracula the books that he used, the the guidebooks of the time, and so I start pulling those things out. I could get you know cheap copies of those on the internet, and finding out what he knew, what descriptions of places, and of course, where was the places of influence of this Vlad Dracula guy. So you've really got two streams um, of what I've what I've started to do. Is, is when I lead these tours, um, you know, I kind of joke and say, you know, the two streams shall not cross, you know, Vlad Dracula <laughs> and Count Dracula, the historical guy and uh, the fictional guy. And in many cases, the Romanians appreciate that because they're at Vlad Dracula, even though he had a seven-year reign, three different short reigns to, to accumulate to seven, uh, he was quite a hero. Um and, and the people in his country recognized that this teeny little country, which was very mountainous, that was kind of shoved in the middle of you know, this area that was dominated by the uh, Ottoman Empire on one side, that's the sort of Turkey and all the power on that side, and the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, and then sort of Christianity, um, you know, that, they were, that there, was, there was the rest of Europe. And so here's this massive kind of struggle between the Muslim Empire and the Christian Empire, and here's the war little Romania right in the middle. And Vlad Dracula did his best, sort of is a guerrilla warfare tactician, uh, holding back this massive Ottoman Empire. Um, and he did, he did so with kind of horrible, what we look back as terror tactics, all this impalement and boiling people and nailing people's turbans on, all these things that he would do um, to, to scare the daylights out of the invaders. And he, he was successful for seven years. Uh, but the other thing that people don't quite get is that Vlad's not the only guy that did that sort of thing. There was a lot of sort of horrible uh, sort of scare tactics used to sort of control people in those days. And that's, you know, that was, you know, what he did very well. Um, but, yeah, I do. I lead six six and 12-day tours, and we actually cross. We I, I joke about the stream shall not cross because it is fun to go and see. Let's go see where the book took place. But let's also see where Vlad Dracula reigned. And there, and there is sort of a, a point where everything comes together in this marvelous brand castle. Um, it's a bit of a controversial castle because when I go there, I get accused of, you know, pimping out. But Vlad Dracula may have been there um, a little bit. It was a strategic place for Vlad Dracula because he was uh, very interested in collecting taxes from the, the Saxons. That's the German people that moved into the into the country to be the, the tradesmen. Uh, and they hadn't been paying taxes. There was a deal they had with a previous ruler that we just we just need you in the country to help with, you know, provide goods and services. And after a while, uh, as far as Vlad was concerned, that deal was no longer uh, valid because what was more important is he needed taxation to build an army so the country didn't get overrun by the Ottomans. So he set up these border crossing uh, checkpoints and uh, Brand Castle's right on one of these border crossings between um, Wallachia and Transylvania. And so, even though 
Bram Stoker saw in his books two sketches of Bran Castle, and the way he described it in writing looked an, looks an awful lot like Bran Castle. Um, he placed the castle in the novel 400 miles up to the north, but to this day, the people that run and, and, and go visit Bran Castle love to call it Dracula's Castle, and they get away with it, and nobody really cares except for you know, real staunch historians or academics. Um, I go there, and I've actually had very positive times there with the, the manager and the, uh, the, the the guides, and I've actually they've asked me to help train the guides better to tell the story. And so now I'm very proud to say they say, well, there's not very much chance that that um, Vlad was actually here, but it's a good story. Here's how Bram Stoker knew about it. But let's tell tell you about Queen Marie, who you know really is this. Uh, you know, lo lovely queen who endeared herself to her people. It really was her castle. So I've had some positive impacts um, on, on tourism, and uh, I've been invited to tourist conferences put on by the government to help people set the story right and tell the right story, um, and also embrace what, what I find really interesting in this wonderful country of Romania, that, that uh, you know, you've got to really think back to, this is one of the areas where the actual vampire superstitions originated. You know, Bram didn't choose this country just because it was way off in the middle of nowhere and Vlad Dracula was there. It was the melting pot of different cultures, different religions, different superstitions, and it was isolated and mountainous, and it just had some you know, really cool vibe to it. And part of that vibe, which was kind of strange, is that as different diseases would sweep th across Europe starting in about, you know, 1600, people didn't really understand what was causing these diseases. And back in those days, they would turn to the most educated person in the village or the town, the city. It was the ch church. And the church in those days would normally say, well, it's, it's God's will. You know, we need to kill a couple hundred people because we don't have enough food or, you know, it's okay. They're going to go off to heaven. They're going to die. They'll be, they'll be taken care of. But after a while, you know, the, the church couldn't answer what people really wanted to know. So superstition kind of boiled to the top. And it's like this desire people wanted to know. There was a lot of darkness. There was wolves. There was bears. There was weird stuff going on in the natural world that people would turn to the supernatural to kind of get explanations. And part of this was, you know, why is, you know, why, why is my family dying? And I'll give you a, a short example here. But let's just say that you know, Lisa's family is, is sick and, and it's the plague. Somebody in the household is, you know, fevered and they're sweating and they're getting sick and they, and they finally die. And they take the, the person, you know, the father, and put him in the grave, bury them, have a nice ceremony, lots of mourning rituals that everybody goes through. But what they don't get is that that same disease that killed the father is, is already in other people in the family. And maybe Lisa's got it. And she's now getting the same fever and the night sweats and the delirious. And she kind of feels that, oh, my, maybe the father or my husband, someone's coming out of, the, out of the ground. And I'm seeing him in my dreams and he's taking the life from me. And so they would interpret this unexplained way why the others are getting sick as the people from the grave are coming out and taking the life from you. So they would gather around with the town elders and even the priests, they go to the grave, the recently, you know, filled in grave, and they dig the guy up. And they didn't really know what bodies looked like in those days with the bloating that would come with the biological decomposition and the gases and the juices, you know, the liquids that would kind of drip out of the mouth and the nose. And, and, it, and it was even quite bizarre because they would wrap people in a cotton shroud, but those, you know, enzymes and things would come out of the mouth and make it look like the cloth was being chewed away. And so they thought, oh, my God, this guy's got a full belly and he's got stuff dripping from his mouth. He must have been the one that's coming out of the grave and drinking, you know, for Lisa. So they stabbed the guy with a big stake or a wood or a metal pole to keep him in the ground. And that's where this whole staking came from. But quite often when you do that, all these gases would explode out of the body and go through the vocal cords and make the guy grunt like, Ugh! And so they'd hear this audible gasp, and they would think that that was the guy groaning because he was undead or dead undead. And so they did the right thing. They got him in the ground. 
So that sort of misinterpretation of the whole communicable diseases and the biological process would confirm that these creatures are coming out looking for looking for life. And that's that's what was happening in this part of the world. And Bram made note of that uh, in, in an interview that he gave. He, he found about 20 countries that had old stories like this. And I'm not kidding you that, you know, even in 2003, um, there was one of these exhumations in uh, rural parts of Romania. So some of these these old superstitions die hard. <laughs> Sorry for the, the pun. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I oh, I find that fascinating. And as you were describing it, I'm thinking, you know, why don't we get more of, uh, you know, in, in uh, often I will say that the vampire uh, in films, in, in in books too, but you know, it's often so glamorized. And uh, I wish we would get that real visceral. <laughs> <laughs> to decaying corpse. Uh, yeah. Well, we get it. You know, we joke about it. We get it with the with the zombies. Right. And, and it's fun. It's fun. It's funny how zombies have kind of you know zombies, vampires. Who's who's got the best movie? Who's got more books? But really, when you think about it, you know, people would say, you know, Bram's Dracula looks more like a zombie uh, than Bela Lugosi. That's that's been a product of having to please audiences on, you know, stage on. Imagine if the first Dracula looked like, you know, somebody walking dead. Everybody would be running the heck out of the theater rather than Bela Lugosi, a nice dinner jacket. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Um, I wonder if that's what makes the character so enduring. Um, it is this, this count aspect to it because, I mean, we've talked about the vampire as a uh, myth and where it came from, but, you know, making Dracula the count and making him the, um, the kind well, of wealthy sexy. foreign man. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you, you can't discount the fact that in Bram's day, his book, I don't want to say if it's R rated, but it definitely would be pretty close to, you know, R rated that you know, many people don't get it. When you put in perspective, the Victorian era who were very stuffy, on the surface, but, you know, opium dens and homosexuality and prostitution, you know, all behind the doors and in the back alleys. Bram writes a book and, and inserts these things that are very risque, which is, you know, these, this, you know, Lucy, very well-to-do girl, three suitors, you know, chooses one of them. But then she, you know, is met by Dracula, who has a very sexy scene with her when, you know, she exposes the neck and he goes in and there's a fluid exchange, you know, all that was kind of very risque at the time. And so when you when you take that and keep it in perspective and move it forward, it's, you know, the whole concept of this dashing kind of guy who's all powerful, but very suave and debonair is going to give you a really cool life, you know, immortality and <laughs> be around forever, which, you know, is in, in some respects, it's pretty cool. It's it's not, oh, they're going to turn you into some, you know, body that's going to just f fall apart and, you know, just decay while you're walking around. The, the, the zombies aren't nearly as sexy as the vampires are. <laughs> but, I mean, we, we also realize that with the TV shows like True Blood and Vampire Diaries and Buffy the Vampire Slayer, you know, the vampires are looking like everyday people and some of them like runway models. And they you know, really take that to another another level. So, you know, Bram started it. But, boy, people are taking it in really cool directions to to kind of make it something that is maybe not what he intended. But I think that's OK, because, you know, it's a it's a, certainly an enduring uh, genre with lots of cool tropes that just keep keep people want more of it. Well, you have continued that. You know, you mentioned um, the sequel that you wrote with Ian Holt, uh, Dracula the Undead, which follows uh, Quincy, uh, Mina's son. Um, and then can you, you have a new book coming out in October, right? That is, am I right in saying it's a prequel? Yeah, yeah. I, okay. I mean, I've sort of done things backwards. But, you know, I guess it's because when I came into this, um, it, it just seemed to me that um, Ian and I should should continue the story, and and Ian actually had a screenplay that uh, he wanted to you know use parts of, and so that made more sense. But since then, all the lectures and the research that I did, um, I've done all over the world in some really bizarre places. 
Um, but people have been really interested in what makes Bram tick and what made him write the book and what is it about him. And so after you know seven years of doing that, I thought, well, I need to fictionalize this and put it as the story of the guy that wrote Dracula, but really fictionalize it so that he's writing Dracula as if it's real. And that I got from some of the cool little things that I've unearthed, like the Icelandic edition of Dracula that uh, has been found by Hans de Roos and, and others to be a different story. But the preface that was unearthed by a guy called Richard Dalby, who is no longer with us, but a really good researcher found in 1989, that this preface which didn't go into the first book that was published, the first edition in, in uh, London in 1897, but was in the Icelandic edition, 1901, was convincingly real. And, and with research, I found that some authors have done, did that in those days. I mean, they really like pulling your leg. They're saying, no, this is really true. And, but having read that thing over and over again and getting into Bram's Mind and Lost Journal, I thought, you know what? What if it was real? Just, you know, as authors do, we take license. What if? And after a glass of wine, it's like, okay, what if now I can really make it good? And so it, it was the, the, the prequel that's coming out with, with J.D. Barker um, is the story of Bram growing up and the s situations in his life, the illness and how he was healed, um, and then tweaked a little bit to, to make it sound like, you know, he had he, he met a vampire at some stage of his life and, and this became Dracula. And so he's got to end up writing Dracula as a warning to the rest of the world. And, and I can't tell much more than that, unfortunately, because uh, it doesn't come out till October. And I don't want to give too, too many spoilers away. But um, it, it, I'm really excited. The book has sold in 10 countries and Paramount has actually bought the, the film rights to it um, even before the book has come out. And, and they've attached Andy Machete the uh, director ah. of Steve Geek's <laughs> It. Yeah. So uh, we've already got, um, you know, a, a real world-class guy, a director attached to this. And I understand now they're looking for, um, they're going through a process of looking for screenwriters. So JD and I are really excited about it. Um, I just came back from, from London where I met with our British publisher and, you know, what events are we going to be doing to promote the thing? Um, but I, th I think it's going to be, um, it, it's, it's going to be a wonderful story that's going to kind of straddle, I believe, um, you know, sort of vampire lovers as well as history lovers, because it is uh, a story of the Stoker family. And there's some really cool interaction between the kids. You know, as, as I mentioned earlier, it's one of seven kids and, and uh, these guys didn't have an easy life. Um, but, you know, there's some really cool interplay between brother and sister and, and Bram's oldest brother, who I know for a fact really did help him write Dracula. Uh, his oldest brother, Sir William Thornley Stoker, was a very famous doctor of the time. And uh, I was lucky enough, J.D. and I got an invitation by Paul Allen, the, one of the two guys that um, invented uh, Microsoft. Uh, he owns the a num number of things Mr. Allen owns uh, and has in a, in a museum that he's a, a be uh, benefactor of, the Museum of Popular Culture in Seattle. But he owns the, the manuscript for Dracula, technically called a typescript because it was typed on a typewriter. And I got to look through all these pages along with J.D. And we could see the things that Sir William Thornley, the medical things that he uh, gave Bram little hints on, what, what he should change, what he should put in. But one of the coolest things that I just got to plug is we found what, what we think was missing from the first 102 pages uh, 101 pages of the novel. The manuscript starts on page 102. And researchers for years have tried to wonder, wh where are these pages? Well, Bram's widow published a book, uh, short stories, two years after Bram died and said, here's one story that was excised from the manuscript of Dracula because of length. And it's called Dracula's Guest. And it's a cool story of a guy very much like Jonathan Harker. I'm sure it's Harker, but it's just not named that way. He was traveling to uh, Transylvania, and he stops in Munich because of the train schedule and, and has a day to burn. And he takes a trip uh, in a carriage into the countryside because he wants to see what the place looks like. And the carriage driver stops at a crossroads, and he won't go any further. And, and there's a superstition, of course, that 
suicide victims who become vampires or buried at crossroads. And it also happens to be Walpurgis night, very last day of April. And that's the night kind of like Halloween over here where all evil things have full sway. And so the carriage driver abandons this Harker character who starts wa wandering around the, the, the countryside. And he comes across this, this village that has a graveyard in it, and it starts to snow on him, which is kind of strange for the end of April, not, not that unusual. And he seeks refuge inside a big crypt. Here's, here's a wolf howling, so he goes inside the crypt just to be safe. And he sees a, um, a, a, an inscription um, on this, this grave um, for this Countess Dolagen von Graz that she uh, basically sought death. She was a suicide victim. Uh, and uh, as I said earlier, suicides in those days were known to become vampires. And so obviously this guy falls into this, 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 this little crypt and he, he's in the presence of a vampire and he's overcome by hypothermia. And as he sort of flops down, as he sort of dream states, this wolf comes into the crypt and lays on top of him and, and licks his throat to keep him warm and alive. Doesn't kill him, it's keeping him warm. And the soldiers come who've been sent from the hotel because the guy didn't come back in time and they scare the wolf away and they save him. And I say all that because it sounds to me that that is certainly part of the pages that were missing from the Dracula type script. And it wasn't though until JD and I started looking through what was still in the manuscript but Bram had crossed out. So we found three references to a wolf licking his throat, Walpurgis Night, and a crypt in Munich that Bram had taken out from what was existing in, 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 the, in the typescript. So it, it just proves that that has to be a part of what was the first 101 pages. And so as two guys writing a prequel, we dovetailed the end of our story with what was the original beginning. And that's, that's about all I can say about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fascinating. I, I read Dracula, the Undead, and I really enjoyed it. So I'm really looking forward to um, this book coming out in October. Good. Glad, glad to hear it. <laughs> um, so you're, in, in addition to, because it, it sounds to me like you just live a fantastic life, um, <laughs> but getting to learn all about Bram Stoker, getting to travel all around, um, Romania and uh, vampire country, I guess you can call it, and you're Stoker on Stoker, but you've also been on um, two TV shows recently, um, Mysteries at the Museum. Yeah, that's um, it, it's been fun that obviously somebody else, you know, thinks that I know what I'm talking about, and um, that was a trip. Um, I was, you know, zipped over from, you know, where I live in South Carolina off to uh, Romania, you know, once again to a castle that I'm very, very well aware of, um, Brand Castle, to, um, you know, be interviewed and be part of a show, Mysteries in the Museum. Um, Don Wildman, the, the host, is a great guy. Uh, he had to ride a horse in pouring down rain for about three hours uh, while I got to stand under an umbrella with the film crew all around me uh, because, you know, it was, it was supposed to look like here's Don Wildman coming out of the woods to kind of find you know, Brant Castle and, oh, and there's Dacre Stoker to tell them all about it. <laughs> Conveniently. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm always hanging around my castle. <laughs> well, funnily enough, um, two, two Halloweens ago, Airbnb hired me to be at Brant Castle for a really cool event where 88,000 people tried to um, write a short essay to spend the night in the castle. Uh -huh. um, and, and I actually didn't have to sleep in the coffins with them, but I hosted them and you know, showed them everything. And then I got to go to the hotel for, to go to sleep, <laughs> but I'm not kidding. I still get people emailing me. When are you going to be at your castle? I'd love to come and see you. <laughs> it's like, listen guys, I don't, I don't live there, but I, I go there from time to time. Um, which is fun. The, the other one I did, which was, which was cool, but it was all filmed in England. Um, which was one of these things called, um, secrets of the dead vampire legend. And it's, it's the sort of thing I, I, I was talking earlier in the in the podcast about misconceptions um, of the dead, and and this show was looking at what we call a deviant burial when they find, you know, bodies in graves. You know, nowadays people are you know construction, they're digging up things, and oop, they all stop because they see a grave, and it's it gives opportunities for archaeologists and scientists to come out and sort of oh look, why is the guy's head 
down in between his legs? Or why is there a metal bar or a metal uh, blade across the guy's neck? Or why is there actually a metal rod through his chest? Why is there a brick in his mouth? And so, and, and what the, these archaeologists and, and forensic experts have done is, is figured out that, you know, in the day, there were these superstitions, as I mentioned, and different diseases going around that people misinterpreted and thought they were outbreaks of vampires. And so they would do these weird things to their bodies um, while they were, you know, they're, they're now dead. We've got to cut the head off so this doesn't happen. We've got to stick a, a brick in his mouth so he doesn't come out and eat people. Uh, or we've got to stick a rod in him so he doesn't come out. And that's what the Secrets of the Dead was all about. They, they, they've got some really cool experts and looked at different, different deviant burials around the world and, and found that there was a, a lot of people believing that there was some vampire go vampirism going on for a couple hundred years in Europe. And, and funnily enough, we in America have the same thing uh, in New England in the 1900s that Bram Stoker was aware of. He saw a newspaper article from New York in 1896, while he was writing Dracula, talking all about the New England vampire scare, where there was over 50 um, you know, coroner-approved exhumations of the graves, Mercy Brown being one of them, the Tillinghast family being another, where people believed, but it was, it was tuberculosis at this time that was killing people off, not the plague, but these old superstitions that sort of came from from Europe over to America with the original settlers, kind of, as I said, it, it takes a, a long time for those superstitions to go away. Some really interesting information, especially about the New England vampire panic. Uh, Dacre, I was wondering if you could, we could go back a little bit to your Stoker on Stoker presentations. If you would like to share with us maybe uh, one of the most interesting places you presented that lecture at. Oh, boy. Um, yeah, in about seven years, I've been, you know, all over the globe, but probably the, the, the weirdest place when I mention this to people is Guantanamo Bay Naval Base. Um, you know, it's kind of like a USO tour. They, they send entertainers and writers and, and people to, to places to entertain the troops. And what I didn't realize was, you know, besides just the, you know, the, the guys who are in lockup in the orange suits because they were terrorists, there's lots of other people in Guantanamo Bay who, who support the... U.S. Navy and and uh, help in the Caribbean drug trafficking and you know stopping all that kind of stuff and, and hurricane relief. So I have I actually had an old friend from college who who worked down there as a judge in the judicial system and he put a good word in for me and uh, me and about forty other people went down um, a couple of Octobers ago and had a wonderful time entertaining the people and of course mine was my, probably one of the more gruesome things you're talking about vampires and but it was October after all and. So it seemed to be the right right place, but um, that that's definitely the most sort of interesting and bizarre place I've ever been in my life. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you're not changing my mind at all on that. I think you just li live a fantastic, fascinating life because in between <laughs> castles in Romania and uh, lost journals in uh, England. And now you're uh, talking about Bram Stoker in Guantanamo Bay. <laughs> I think that's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad to keep you, you, you folks and your listeners entertained. It, it really is fun, and it's, uh, it's, it, it, it really is a life worth living, but you got to pay your dues and do a, lot of, you know, do a lot of research and work so that people do want to hear what you have to say and what you, what you have to, to write about. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Daker, for joining us. And um, I really want to encourage our listeners, first, if you haven't bought Dracula the Undead um, with Ian Holt, to go buy that because it is a, it's a really fun book. And, uh, of course, Dracul with J.D. Barker is coming out in October. Yep. Thank you all very much. I appreciate your time. Oh, thank you.